Nine months ago, I started using a 2013 Mac Pro as my main desktop machine. I started with a base model, which I then upgraded, and I made some videos about it along the way, which proved quite popular. And I also use an eGPU as part of this setup. And I know from the comments that I've received on YouTube that many of you are curious about that. So, it's time for an update. Can a professional creative really use one of these outdated machines for modern workflows? Let me share what I've learned. So let's start with the specs and how my rig is set up. Now I began with that base model, the Quad Core Xeon, 12 gigs of RAM and it has the dual D300 GPUs. It was actually a machine that we bought new for one of our designers in the web studio that we run. And when we replaced it three or four years later with an iMac, I bought the Mac Pro personally from the company. And it's nice to know the history of a machine when you're buying used, and I know that mine's always been well cared for. But that Quad Core Xeon, it's not a particularly rapid CPU, so I decided to upgrade to a 12 core. I lost a little single threaded performance, but I gained a whole bunch of multi threaded performance. I got four matching 16 gigabyte DIMMs, so RAM increased to 64 gigabytes, and it also upgraded the SSD. Now, it came as stock with a Generation 2 Apple 256 gig SSD, and I found a Generation 3 SSD with 512 gigabytes for a decent price. And that newer Generation 3 drive makes full use of the PCI 2.0 X4 bandwidth, giving roughly double the performance of that stock drive. I'm running a Razer Core X Chroma eGPU enclosure. And I went for this particular model because it's got an onboard Ethernet port and four USB 3.1 Type A ports. And since I used the eGPU also with a couple of MacBook Pros that we've got, the Ethernet seemed like a good extra because that would allow me to dock the laptop with just one cable. But as it transpires, the Ethernet port doesn't have native macOS drivers, and the drivers that you have to download are flaky at best. And I'm pretty fed up with Razer for not making this incompatibility clear. Nonetheless, it's not the end of the world because I primarily use that eGPU with the Mac Pro, which of course already has two Ethernet ports. The USB 3.1 ports on that eGPU are useful because the Mac Pro only has USB 3.0, so having faster ports is beneficial. Now obviously you don't want to saturate the bandwidth of the Thunderbolt 2 connection by plugging in loads of USB devices, but I do have my storage array attached to the eGPU and this setup works fine for me. Inside the eGPU, we've got a Radeon RX 5700 XT Nitro Plus. Mine is made by Sapphire, and it's their top of the range overclocked edition. Now naturally, you do lose some of the performance of the card through the Thunderbolt connection, but it's not as much as you might think. The eGPU is connected to the Mac Pro with a Thunderbolt 2 cable, and then Apple's Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2 adapter. Uh, since Apple don't officially support eGPU use on the 2013 Mac Pro, I've made use of the third-party script called Purge Wrangler. I've got the eGPU connected to the bottom left Thunderbolt port on the Mac, and yes, it does seem to make a difference. Uh, when it's plugged into this port though, it boots up fine with the eGPU attached. And in fact, I've only got my monitor plugged into the eGPU. I don't use the onboard ports on the Mac for my display. In fact, the only time I plug my display into the onboard GPU is for an OS update. Once you've installed the OS update and you've rebooted, the Purge Wrangler script fires up automatically and re-enables the eGPU support. It's really easy to use. Uh, speaking about the monitor, many people have asked me about that as well. It's a 32-inch Dell UltraSharp 4K display. Uh, this one's got a USB-C input as well, which is useful for quickly attaching a laptop when I don't need the eGPU. And it will also charge the MacBook through that connection. Uh, but mainly I got it because I just really like the ultra sharp displays. They're solid performers, they've got decent color calibration from the factory. Uh, yeah, sure, professional colorists will still want to calibrate, but they are great straight out of the box and would satisfy most professionals. Uh, we've got quite a number of these in different sizes in our web studio. Uh, not the cheapest screens, but you do get what you pay for. Uh, finally, another piece of equipment I have is a DisplayPort dummy plug, which I use with my eGPU because there is a bug in the drivers in macOS for the 5700 XT, whereby you get better performance if you have two displays plugged in. So I use this dummy plug, which fools the GPU into thinking it's got a second 4K display plugged in. And then I set the display arrangement to mirror in macOS so that I don't end up losing my mouse cursor off the edge of the screen to that invisible dummy display. 
Now, it doesn't make any difference to performance for gaming, but it does make a big difference to video render times. Now, some people say that this is a bug with benchmarks only and that it, it doesn't make any real-world difference, but that's not true, and I've proved it in some tests that I've done with Final Cut Pro. The other accessory parts of my rig are a DaVinci Resolve micro panel, uh, which is used for fast colouring, um, something I'm no expert in, but I'm trying to learn that in my spare time. Uh, I've also got a PreSonus Faderport 8 audio control surface. And I use this for creating music in Logic Pro, and which is a bit of a hobby. I don't do that commercially. But it does also work as a control surface for Fairlight, which is the audio program within DaVinci Resolve. And then I've got two Yamaha powered studio monitors connected to an M-Audio USB audio interface. Uh, and this is the part of my setup that just doesn't work yet. I have to do all my editing with headphones on. There's nothing wrong with those Yamaha speakers, it's the M-Audio interface, which is not really very good, uh, but becomes completely unusable when the eGPU is plugged in, because it picks up loads of electrical noise. Uh, I've tried connecting it to the MacBook Pro and the eGPU, and the same thing happens, so I'm going to need to figure out a different device here. So that's my setup. How does the 2013 Mac Pro stand up in this environment? Uh, well, it depends what you're doing. Let's start with the day-to-day -day office tasks. I use Office 365 with my business, and I spend a lot of time in Excel, Outlook, and OneNote. And these apps all benefit from having great single-core performance, uh, which the 2013 Mac Pro doesn't really have. I mean, it's, it's adequate, it's perfectly usable, but I notice some sluggishness when I'm working on large Excel sheets with lots of formulae and graphs. And likewise, complex web apps quickly show the weaknesses of the single-threaded performance. Uh, SharePoint, for example, we use that with our business, and that, again, is quite sluggish. Trying to open one of those big spreadsheets that I just mentioned in the online version of Excel, well, that's not a great experience. Uh, so I tend to use my 13-inch MacBook Pro instead when I need to use these tools. But that doesn't mean that the 2013 Mac Pro is slow for day-to-day -day general computing. It's only when you start pushing the boundaries with modern web apps that you start noticing limitations. I think for most people, using email, browsing the web, and consuming content, the performance will be fine. I use the Mac Pro mostly for video editing, so let's talk about that. Now, originally I was using Final Cut Pro, but I got to the point where I found this just too frustrating to use with the eGPU. You can ask Final Cut to use the eGPU for background renders, but that doesn't mean that it will. I spent time watching the GPU usage with Activity Monitor, and what I found is a lot of the time, Final Cut will favour using one of the internal D300s, regardless of what you ask it to do with the eGPU. Now, naturally, since I'm running Final Cut on a display that's connected directly to the eGPU, it does help to accelerate that timeline performance. But I also want it to speed up those background renders, and I want it to speed up the final render. And in my experience, Final Cut never fully utilises the eGPU, and it seems to prefer maxing out one of the internal D300s. And I say one of the D300s because when the eGPU is connected, it seems to only ever use one of them. And I've never been able to figure out what's going on with that. And frankly, I got so fed up with it that I actually stopped using my Mac Pro for a while and did my editing instead on one of my MacBooks. Then I tried DaVinci Resolve. I'd bought a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, and this comes with a license for the full version of Resolve Studio. And I think this is important to say because the free version uh, lacks multi-GPU support. Now, I do think the free version will use both the internal GPUs on the Mac Pro, but if you've got an eGPU and you want to use all of them, then you need that full version. And I also think Studio's got GPU acceleration for H.264, and that's probably quite important for most people. But when you look at comparisons between DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro on the YouTube, on the internet, it's often not a fair comparison. They're comparing the free version of Resolve with the paid-for version of Final Cut. Now, Final Cut costs $300, as does DaVinci Resolve. I think Resolve Studio gives you a lot more for your money, but I'll save that for another video review. But using Resolve Studio, you really do seem to get the maximum from the system. When I do the final render, it's so gratifying to see the eGPU is maxed out, and both of those internal D300s are being used as well. Renders seem to be faster as a result, and the timeline performance is generally very good.
Now when I'm using the Pocket Cinema camera, I'm shooting either in Blackmagic RAW 4K with 3 to 1 compression or with ProRes 422. And these are high bitrate codecs, but the Mac Pro with the eGPU handles them like a hot knife through butter. I shoot primarily at 25 frames per second, and I haven't really tried any high frame rates yet, but I do know that it works fine at 50 frames per second. When I come into the studio like today, we're typically shooting with a Panasonic Pro camcorder or a GH5, but we also have in our arsenal a GH4, a G9, some GoPros, a DJI drone, and a couple of Osmos. And all of these cameras are using the H.264 codec, and this doesn't work so well. At 4K, 25 frames per second, you do get some stuttering when you're scrubbing the timeline. Playback is fine and it's perfectly usable, but the experience is not as good as those higher bitrate codecs. So why is it that a codec with a quarter of the bitrate should be worse in performance? Well, H.264 is a heavily compressed codec, so it requires some serious horsepower to decompress it. And this is best achieved with a purpose-built chip rather than a general purpose CPU or GPU. And that's why Intel introduced QuickSync into their CPUs to do precisely this job. Apple's doing similar things with the T2 chip for modern high efficiency codecs. And no doubt Apple Silicon will have custom hardware on board to do this job quickly. But the 2013 Mac Pro doesn't have a T2 chip. It doesn't have any custom hardware and the Xeon E5 V2 family of CPUs doesn't have Intel QuickSync. So H.264 content has to be handled by either the CPU or GPU, depending on the software you're using. And simply, this isn't as efficient, so it will be slower. What I will say is if you know you're going to be editing 4K video in H.264, and bear in mind that's what most consumer cameras output, then the 2013 Mac Pro isn't an ideal partner for editing that content. Now sure, you could convert your H.264 footage to ProRes 422 first, and that will massively speed up your editing process but it will take a lot of time in the first place to convert the footage, and it's just not an efficient way of working. Another workaround would be to use an external recorder with your camera that records in ProRes format, uh, if your camera supports that and has a decent HDMI output, that is. If you're editing 1080p, of course, the 2013 Mac Pro will breeze through it. And in my experience, with my setup, including the eGPU, it's more than up to the task of working with ProRes 422 or Blackmagic RAW. One of the reasons that people will pay more money for a professional grade machine is stability. And I think it's fair to say that at times stability has been lacking with my 2013 Mac Pro. The initial versions of macOS Catalina didn't play well with the 2013 Mac Pro, especially if you upgraded from Mojave without doing a fresh install. I did that and I found my system was unstable, I kept getting kernel panics and the black screen of death. However, with the various updates that have been released for the OS, uh, Apple has quietly improved that stability, and I haven't seen a kernel panic in months. When you experience system instabilities like this, your natural reaction is to think that perhaps there's a hardware fault. But this clearly wasn't the case. It's actually software problems, and Apple didn't do their testing properly on Catalina. Uh, although I did have one incident where the Mac Pro overheated and crashed pretty spectacularly and I ended up completely dismantling it and reapplying thermal paste to the GPUs and the CPU. The 2013 Mac Pro has got all of its components on a central triangular heatsink. There's a CPU board on one side and GPUs on the other two sides. And then one of the GPU boards has the SSD attached to it. You've got a single fan at the top which is drawing air through the bottom of the case, uh, like a chimney, to cool the central heatsink and all of those other components. This is actually a great design, and it works really well if the fan is allowed to ramp up to a sensible speed. But it seems that Apple made quiet running a priority over cooling, so the fan doesn't ramp up early enough. And since you've got all of those components sharing a central heatsink, this can result in everything boiling over. For example, if you're rendering out a video and at the same time doing some file copying, you've got a recipe for disaster the CPU, GPUs, and the SSD are all going to be getting hot at the same time. And this is what happened to me. And the acceleration of that heat meant that by the time the fan span up, it was just too late. And that sounds like a pretty horrific flaw, but it's actually very easily resolved with a third-party app. I use TG Pro. It doesn't cost very much, and it gives you the ability to manually ramp the fan up, or you can program it. 
and I've got mine programmed to ramp up to the maximum speed by the time any part of the system hits 60 degrees centigrade. And ever since I did that, I've never seen temperatures above 62 degrees, and I've not had any overheating issues. So that Mac Pro design is clearly capable of cooling all of those components, but you just need to tweak the fan curves. The great thing about having an app to control the fan is that you can switch it on and off manually. So if you need silent running for audio production, you can do that. And if you need maximum cooling whilst you're rendering, well, you can do that too. So I guess the question you might be thinking is, will I keep using this older computer? Well, to be honest, before I switched to Resolve for my video editing, I had gotten very frustrated and I decided to sort out some finance for a new 2019 Mac Pro. Uh, by a workhorse that could last me for the next five or six years. But before I had the chance to pull the trigger, Apple announced the transition to Apple Silicon, and that screwed up all of my total cost of ownership calculations for the new Mac Pro, since I now don't know what it will be worth at the end of my ownership period. So I decided to hold fire, and then after that I ended up trying Resolve, and that gave my 2013 Mac Pro system a new lease of life. So I'm going to use that funding instead to get an Apple Silicon Mac when they're released. I want to do a bunch of testing, I want to make some content for the channel. Now, to be clear, I'm not expecting that Apple will release anything this year that could replace my Mac Pro, but at the very least, it should help me to decide whether I should wait longer for better Apple Silicon and keep using this 2013 Mac Pro, or whether I should do something else. Now, when I'm talking about something else, I'm not referring to an Intel Mac. Uh, I'm not confident in the life cycle now of Intel Macs. I need something that's gonna last me for five or six years. So I have a backup plan. I'm quite excited by AMD's fourth generation Ryzen CPUs that are gonna be released in a couple of weeks. And Resolve Studio is available for Windows and indeed Linux. So I might actually consider building a PC for my video editing. I know, don't panic Apple fans. I actually use both platforms quite happily and I still have a personal preference for Mac OS as a daily driver. But since I can do my work on either platform, that's a nice position to be in. Now, usually when I post content about the 2013 Mac Pro, there'll always be some kind of PC fanboyism in the comments section. Uh, these guys will tell you, you can build a much cheaper Ryzen-based machine that'll be more powerful and, uh, yeah, we, we get that. We understand that, we know that's true, but uh, this, these kind of arguments completely miss the point. Uh, and they don't take into consideration the financial realities and commercial realities that business owners face. For many creative professionals, they may be tied into software that is specific to the macOS ecosystem. And more than that, it's not an option for them to change because their clients also use that same software. The cost of moving everything over to another software platform, another operating system, and then having that friction with your clients will far outweigh the cost difference between the Apple and the PC. Of course, there is also the Hackintosh route, but certainly a lot of professional users won't be interested in tinkering with an unsupported solution. The thing is, since I moved to Resolve, it's not a problem that I'm facing, because every piece of software that I need a powerful desktop to handle is now available to me on PC. So building an editing rig, that's quite a tempting option. And speaking of Windows, a few people have asked me about bootcamp performance on the 2013 Mac Pro. Now I have got a Windows 10 installation working on an external USB SSD. So I just plug in that SSD and I boot from it to get straight into Windows. What I haven't managed to do is get the eGPU working in Windows. Now without going into loads of technical detail, this is due to the way that Windows assigns hardware resources. And the only way to really resolve it is to mess about with open core. And I just don't wanna do that on my 2013 Mac Pro at this point. What I can tell you is that the internal GPUs do indeed show up in Windows as being connected with Crossfire X. So providing your software supports that, a couple of D300s would actually deliver decent enough performance. I don't think I'd rush out to buy a 2013 Mac Pro just to run Windows though. And in fact, I'm not sure at this point in October 2020 that I could wholeheartedly recommend buying one of these machines, unless you've got a workflow that isn't GPU dependent. It's still a great option for audio professionals and developers. Uh, imagine a developer needing to run a bunch of virtual machines. Well, an eight, 10 or 12 core model is gonna have plenty to offer for these types of workflows. What if you do have a GPU dependent workload? Should you go out and buy a 2013 Mac Pro and then invest in an eGPU to go with it? And I get asked this question quite a lot. And what I would say is just make sure you do your homework and analyze the value proposition. 
A GPU setup like I've got is knocking on the door of $800, and that's quite a lot to spend. I split that investment, of course, across my Mac Pro and my laptops. Um, but if you're going out just to buy a Mac Pro and getting an eGPU just for that, then you need to make sure that it's going to give you enough value and enough benefit. If you add the cost of the eGPU to the cost of the Mac Pro, that's quite a big purchase. And there are other options that may suit you better at that kind of price. And when we speak about price of the Mac Pros on the, the used market, they shot up when the 2019 Mac Pro was released. Because it was just out of the budget for many small professionals, attention naturally turned to the 2013 Mac Pro. I managed to get mine just before that massive price rise happened. And so even with the money I've spent on the upgrades, I'm fairly confident I could actually sell my machine now for a profit, or at least break even. So my user experience has been mixed rather than seamless, but overall the 2013 Mac Pro has been fantastic value for money. And I've enjoyed using it and tinkering with it. Uh, it's been great creating content, it's been lovely interacting with people all around the world. And whatever I decide to do next, I'm glad that I've owned this machine because it's taught me a lot. So I hope you enjoyed this overview of my system and this nine month update. And I'm sure it won't be the last bit of 2013 Mac Pro content that I make, but I am also looking forward now to covering the new Apple Silicon products. And depending on how that goes, potentially a high end PC build. In the next few weeks, I'll be testing and reviewing the new iPad Air. I've also got a seven day video diary with the new Apple Watch Series 6 coming to the channel. And we've started our regular Monday Tech podcast. If you enjoy all of this sort of content, please consider subscribing to support the channel. It only costs you one click. Uh, be sure to leave a comment if you've got something to share. I always enjoy interacting with you in the comments section. And hopefully I did enough to earn a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that's your thing. But in any case, see you next time for some more geekery.